why certain spaces are created particularly for spiritual growth, to sustain and nourish spiritual aspirations, which is innate in every human being. Why such a space is needed? <clears throat> because once we create a place where hundred, two hundred, a thousand people have to live together, it comes with its problems. You cannot avoid the problems. If you have to put thousand people in one place, with common areas where they have to share and interact and collide on a daily basis. <clears throat> there are bound to be problems. And these problems that come because of a lot of human beings living in one particular space are very essential for one's growth. <coughs> in the sense, like uh, today morning we were, the teachers meet and we were looking at this. <coughs> A couple of generations ago, everywhere, but especially in this culture, people lived in large families. Even today, there are few families like that, two hundred, three hundred people in a family. If two hundred, three hundred people have to live in one house, where every moment you are close to each other in so many ways, even the air that you breathe you have to share with people around you, it takes enormous balance and maturity for a person to go through those situations without getting too entangled in irritations and agitations and anger and hatred. Very easily people can get into intense states of anger and hatefulness when people live in close proximity. <clears throat> it is also a possibility for enormous amount of love, compassion, caring, but the other thing is also very much possible. As <coughs> I don't want to blame everything on education, <laughs> but to a large extent because the way the modern education is being imparted, slowly living with people is becoming more and more difficult. So initially family meant mother, father, grandmother, grandmother, husband, wife, children, uncle, aunt, their children, their children, their children, their children, you know, a huge group of people. Then slowly as we became more and more capable of being irritable, more and more unacceptable within ourselves, more and more individualistic. Then we thought family means me, my parents, husband, wife, child. Then slowly we thought family means we dropped father, mother, the family means just husband, wife, children. Slowly it's going further. It's in Western societies it's reached a certain point. In large Indian cities also it is going in that direction. <clears throat> Today family means just you. Even two people cannot exist in the same house for long periods of time. Either they have to break up or they have to go away and come back. 
Of course, they have fashionable names for this. Oh, we need our own space. <laughs> There's a whole wide space in the existence. <laughs> Why you need your own separate space? But always I need my own space. <coughs> so what is it that needs this space? What is this that, that is constantly clashing with other living beings around us? Definitely this being is not in conflict with anybody. It is only the limited things that we have identified ourselves with which can be conflict with somebody else or something else. Anyway, once a person says, I want to grow spiritually, he is talking in terms of throwing away all limitations and reach towards boundlessness. So if that has to happen, creating a social situation which is a melting pot for everybody where the situation is such that it is never sufficiently organized so that you don't clash with each other. It is just enough organization so that you are constantly clashing with each other but still learning to love and care and give the best that you can to everybody around you. This is a carefully crafted situation. <laughs> Just to keep it sufficiently confused, not allowing it to go into absolute chaos, but enough confusion to frustrate you constantly on a daily basis. Enough confusion to… enough confusion to keep you constantly looking what the hell is all this about. Enough confusion to make you wonder every day, is this all worthwhile? But never enough confusion to make it totally chaotic. Never enough organization to eliminate all confusion and everything crystal clear, no. It takes lot of effort to keep it in this level of confusion. <laughs> And uh, if this is taken away, if people become too settled into their situations, if it becomes too organized, there will be no spiritual quest in you. You will become comfortable, settled in your own positions, established as in, you know, certain types of identities. So, creating a place like this, every aspect of it has been carefully engineered. Maintaining that balance is a huge feat because one, one day if you don't attend to it, it may go into total chaos. Or if you allow very organized people to take care of it, they will organize it so much that it becomes like a corporation. When it becomes uh, productive, but uh, human beings will disappear and will manufacture machines out of human beings. So just keeping it at the right balance is a difficult feat. I hope always in future also people who live here and manage this place will manage it with necessary dose of confusion, necessary dose of disorganization, at the same time never allowing it to collapse. <coughs> no situation collapses in Isha. Have you noticed? We pull off all situations well, but at the same time every situation is in confusion. <laughs> now, <laughs> only when people are thinking and looking and constantly not knowing where they belong, their ability to imbibe what is offered to them is best. Now, if people become absolutely focused, that would be fine. But that focus is rare. People only tend to become settled. Settlement means no moment. Now, living among these people with a certain dose of confusion constantly can become extremely frustrating for some of you that uh, 
you keep wondering if the whole th- effort is worthwhile. That is why to offset all this confusion, to offset this disorganized way of approaching things, people who come from outside experience Isha as a very well organized setup, but people who live within always experience it as total disorganization. People who come from outside, they always believe our programs, our situations are very wonderfully organized. But people who live here always believe everything is absolutely disorganized. <laughs> so to offset all this, we have invested and loaded this place with a completely different kind of energy. Otherwise, people will not survive this confusion. When I say loading this place with a certain energy, I think uh, many of you should be aware of it, though you don't have a clue how it happens. Right now if you want to experiment, you just… just stand twenty feet outside the fence, sit and meditate, walk into the fence, sit and meditate, it'll be different because we have invested enormous amount of energy to keep this place the way it is. If one allows themselves to melt into it, wonderful things will happen. If you fight it, it will torture you in every possible way because this is not something that you can grasp, this is not something that you can master, this is not something that you can reject. Either you melt into it or you suffer. That's the only way it is. Because the whole spiritual process means just that, that you are willing to melt away your individuality to experience the universality. If you don't want to melt your individuality, then you should not talk spirituality. You should not seek spirituality because you don't know what you are talking about. If you're just seeking spirituality because it's an in thing in the society right now, then it's a wrong thing to do because you don't know what you're playing with. When you say, I want to become spiritual, you're saying, I want to break all my limitations of being individual. I want to become unbounded. That's the statement when you say, I want to be spiritual. But you want to be spiritual and you want to maintain your limitations, you wear your limitations like decorations around your neck, then you will simply cause suffering to yourself. When you cause suffering to yourself, unfortunately and invariably, you will try to infect others around you. Some of you are doing this constantly. Now, uh, Living in a space like this means you have already made up your mind that I want to dissolve, I want to become one with everything, I want to know my ultimate nature. This decision should be made, only then you must enter the space. If this decision is not made, now there are many of you who made this decision on one level, on another level now, when you get entangled with your limitations, when you're at rest. Oh, I don't know any spirituality. I don't care for spirituality. I'm here because, uh, uh, you know, I love Sadhguru, that's why I'm here. <laughs> I don't care for spirituality. Now, <clears throat> You need to understand this. When you say, I love Sadhguru, 
you must understand your love is not for some person. When you say Sadhguru, that means a dissolving agent, a catalyst to dissolve you faster. <laughs> so if you say, I love Sadhguru but I don't want to dissolve, I don't like spirituality, then either you, you are mentally deranged <laughs> or you are somebody who jumps whichever way you like according to your convenience. So both these things are not good. Once you decide to enter a space which is dedicated for a spiritual process, your whole effort should be to dissolve all your limitations. You are on a rail track which goes this way, but you are struggling to go this way. The whole momentum has been pushed this way. The engine is going this way. The bogies want to go this way. Then it is only going to create struggle. You will not go this way. You will anyway go this way but you will go with struggle. Instead of going with joy, you go with struggle. So once you sit with me, that's the only option you have. Whether you like it or you don't like it, I am only taking you this way towards your dissolution. Either you walk through it joyfully or you suffer and cry will drag you and take you. <laughs> but we won't let you go this way. <laughs> So, the space has been created with a certain understanding, above all with an enormous investment of energy. The kind of thing that cannot be taken away by people, the kind of thing that will last for a very, very long time. Especially now, this generation of people who are here, they must do these things with utmost joy and gloriousness because there are certain advantages right now which will not be there later. The energy will be still there, the guidance will be still there, but there are certain advantages now that will not be there later. At least nobody will tell you jokes <laughs> Whether you cry or laugh, it will be yours in future. <clears throat> a spiritual process or an ashram generally means to renounce. The moment I use the word renounce, renounce or renunciation, people think in terms of how to give up the mother-in-law, how to give up the wife, how to give up all the things that we don't like. <laughs> How to get rid of something that is burdensome in our lives. This became a joke. People used to travel to Varanasi in India because it's considered to be the holiest of the holy places. When you go to Varanasi, you are supposed to renounce. That was the idea. But people, as usual, have their tricks. So, today there is a custom or a practice going on. People, <coughs> many Hindus travel to Varanasi and they usually give up some eatable that they don't like. Most of the people give up bitter god and come. They actually do this. They give a bitter god and come. Anyway, they can't stand it. You can give up your neem ball and come. <laughs> no. Renunciation is not about giving up this or that. Renunciation means you have renounced your likes and dislikes. You have renounced your discriminatory process in your mind. There's a very beautiful story. Ramakrishna Paramahamsa used to tell this story very often. <coughs> As I was saying, it has been an age-old custom in this country 
when people attain to a certain age, they renounce everything and go away. Once they reach a certain stage in their life, everything that's precious to them, their wealth, their home, their children, their relatives, all that meant something to them in their lives, to walk away from that. And they usually make a trip to Varanasi, Kashi. So old people at the age of sixty, generally, walk away. The idea is to travel to Varanasi and to travel to many other sacred places, which are places, places of pilgrimage, and die in the process of travel. Or sometimes, if life doesn't leave you, you come back very old. Let's say from here to Varanasi is about three thousand and odd kilometers. Walking on the way, there are many temples and pilgrim places. By the time you visit this whole thing and come back, it may take eight, ten, twelve or twenty years, depending upon how you walk, how much scenery you watch around you, you know. So by that time your life is done. Like this one couple set forth, renounce on the path of renunciation. Husband and wife walking. Husband was walking a few steps ahead of the wife. Then he saw a diamond on the ground. The moment he saw it, he feared that if the wife sees the diamond, she may lose her resolve for renunciation. She may want to pick up the diamond. She may want to keep it in her purse. She may want to wear it around her neck. So with his foot he was trying to hide the diamond in the mud. The wife caught up with him and noticed that he was doing something. She asked him, what are you doing? He tried to avoid the whole issue. Then she saw the diamond and then she said, the moment you distinguish between what is mud and what is diamond, then there is no renunciation in you. The moment you recognize something as precious or something as not, the moment you recognize something as sacred and something as not, then there is no renunciation in you. So when we say renunciation, when we say living in the ashram, it does not mean giving up. It just means that you are capable of involving with every aspect with the same intensity, with the same sacredness. There are two ways. Either you see everything as absolute nonsense, that's one way. Or you see everything as sacred, that's another way. If this is sacred and this is nonsense, then you miss the whole point. If you want to live seeing everything as absolute nonsense, everything and everybody, you see them as total nonsense, then you cannot, you cannot live among people, you must just live alone. That's one way. Or you see everything and everybody as sacred, then this is another way, but now you can live among people. Either you are involved with everything totally without discrimination or you are not involved with anything at all including your body and your mind. That's another way. Both will work wonderfully. But right now, for most of you, the way you are made, your mental makeup and the social situations in which we live, it's better to see everything as sacred rather than seeing everything as nonsense. Both are true. <laughs> Both are wonderful means, but we must choose what we are ready for, isn't it? If you see everything as total nonsense, then you have no sense of involvement with anything, absolutely, including your own body, including your own mind, including your own emotions, you don't attach any importance to anything. Or you attach at most importance to everything in the existence. You don't make a distinction between mud and diamond, everything is diamond for you. Both ways it works.
But here in this ashram, we have chosen to see everything as sacred. Because if you want to live among people, that is the way. So renunciation does not mean giving up what is inconvenient for you. That the whole world is doing anyway, isn't it? Isn't it so? The whole world is always willing to give up that which is not convenient for them. Everybody renounces what they don't like. Everybody renounces what is inconvenient for them. That has no significance, has no value to life. Especially spiritually, it doesn't mean anything. So, once you need to understand, all of you, once you step here, whether you sit here for two days or for the rest of your life, you have made the mistake of sitting with me. Once you made the mistake of sitting with me, you are on the spiritual path. Either you walk willingly and joyfully or you cry and yell and will drag you anyway. It would be nice for all of us if you walked this joyfully. It would be pleasant for the world around us if you walked this joyfully. But if you are the crying kind, we'll bear with you, but we'll still drag you on. <laughs> so, <clears throat> any questions? Sadhguru, uh, when I take my daily walks, go to Mahamudra, to the forest ranger station and back again. Through where? Mahamudra? Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I never thought that was a walking place. <laughs> as soon as I step outside the ashram, there's a very distinct and strong energy shifts that I feel. Um, and I wonder what's going to happen when I go back to the States. Could, could you talk about the difference in this energy shift and why it's so? I know that you've said before that construction workers that come here to work benefit from this place, even stray dogs. And I wanted to know... I didn't mean you, okay. <laughs> That's really... <laughs> <laughs> and I wondered if you could elaborate on that. Okay. <laughs> now, uh, <clears throat> the energy space that is created here, you can take it with you even if you go to Mars. Why states? But you cannot take it to Mahamudra. <laughs> because obviously you… you know this restaurant which is so close by, obviously you are going there because you want a break from the ashram. In your very attitude, you want to get away from this place, that's why you are going to Mahamudra. You can take it to Mars, but you cannot take it to Mahamatra. That's the beauty of the whole thing. <laughs> so whatever is available here, like you say, you notice a difference. Now, this energy, this space, this support, you can take it anywhere you go. But Mahamatra, no. Not because there is something wrong with that place. It is just that, you are going there because you want to escape this. If you want to escape, you escape. What you will escape is just everything that is possible within you. You will escape from that. You will develop strategies of self-defeat. The whole world is busy doing it because when I say the whole world is busy, setting up strategies of self-defeat. Just look at the way people die in the world. If you are in close quarters with people who die, you will see ninety percent of the people 
or even more, why ninety, even more, will die the last moment, you know, out of fear, out of total cluelessness, out of total non-control over their own systems, they will die urinating, they will die passing excreta, the last moment. It is not just physical, these things. These things have a lot to do with how established you are within yourself. What you have done to yourself with the process of life. Have you been self-destructive or have you made something out of this? This is… the moment of death is a clear statement. Your whole life you may pretend, but moment of death you cannot pretend. Who you are, death makes a clear statement out of you. So, you want to wait till then and find out, it's up to you. But if you have any sense, you should do something with yourself now, not setting up strategies against yourself. If you try to avoid that which is a means to your ultimate well-being, definitely you're a self-destructive person, isn't it? If you try to avoid it, if you, even if you try to take a break from that which is for your ultimate well-being, then you are self-destructive in some way. Now you want to eat a different kind of food, that's different. You want to breathe fresher air, that's different. You want to get some exercise, that's different. But you want to escape the situation, that's very different. <clears throat> so that's why I said, this space, this energy, you can take it anywhere you go, but only Mahamudra. <laughs> you can't take it when you're trying to escape it. <laughs> so when I said, anybody who enters the space, even unconsciously, Maybe they come here for business, maybe they come here just to work, even a stray dog, I said. I know we can very easily pass this off as coincidence or maybe so many other explanations. But if you do not know this, every other farm in this area, see we are not so large, it's just a small piece of land in terms of animals. Every other farm in this area with all the securities and electric fences and everything, they have been broken in by animals, wild animals like elephants and other animals. Not once have they done that to the ashram. As you know, our electric fences, ours especially, <laughs> doesn't work all the time. <laughs> Our maintenance department is doing its best, <laughs> but uh, it doesn't work most of the time. But not once, in fourteen years' time, not once, twelve years, okay, whatever, not once have they come. Even if they came, they came through the gate, went out of the gate. That's extremely good behavior for wild animals. <laughs> I'm not saying they've all become meditative, no. But in some way they're influenced or maybe they don't like our food, so maybe they're going to Mahamudra <laughs> If you allow this to happen to you, because now you are no more a stray dog, nor are you a laborer who is coming here unconsciously, you have come at least reasonably consciously. You are not all consciousness, but 
enough consciousness at least to bring you to a place. Once you have that much in you, now there should be no stepping back. Stepping back would be utter foolishness. Now should be no stepping back, just push your gas pedal to the floor and keep it on for the rest of your life. There should be no let up, no brakes, Mahamudra brakes, no, <laughs> all the time on. You must keep it on because <clears throat> what many beings take lifetimes of sadhana to get to, we're trying to create a situation where it should happen to you in this life. So, it needs undivided attention, otherwise it won't happen. Well, what should I do? What should I do? What you do is not the point. How you do everything is the point. If you start looking at, as I earlier mentioned, <coughs> I'm sorry, see, living among hundred, two hundred people on a daily basis, interacting with them on a daily basis, when so many people are there, you know you have to bear with so much. Somebody is not… does not think the way you think, they don't eat the way you eat, they don't wash the way you wash. You know, every aspect, there is every aspect which could irritate you and upset you. <clears throat> People don't think, feel and understand the way you do it. Every human being is different in their own way. And especially now, that Isa is also becoming a kind of cultural melt melting point. You know, they eat differently, they walk differently, they think differently, they feel differently. <laughs> <clears throat> if you give in to this, then living together with such a large group of people will lead to insanity. If you just give in to this process, of liking and disliking what people are doing and not doing, then surely it will push you towards insanity. Only if you have a little deeper establishment within you, if you know something little deeper than your own mind, you know something little deeper than your own emotions, your own dislikes and dislikes, you're not hundred percent free from it, that's okay, but you know a little bit of that. If you don't have that, then this will drive you to distraction. <laughs> if you have that, every day you go through the whole struggle but it doesn't take a toll on you, that's a good situation. That you are not oblivious to the struggles around you, you go through all the struggles, but still it does… it leaves you untouched. This is good for your growth. If you're oblivious, oblivious of the struggles around you, that's not good for you. Then you are like a stray dog. <laughs> a stray dog doesn't know the sufferings that are happening around him. You're aware, you're involved in these struggles, but still you go untouched. That's good. Or if you become a struggle yourself, then again you're lost. So to be involved with everybody's suffering, everybody's nonsense, everybody's limitations, and still to go through it untouched, to have sufficient involvement and caring and everything, but still to go untouched. This is a very good training ground to establish your spirituality. To be spiritual means to know something which is beyond the physical, to know something which is beyond this mind and this body. So, whether you know something beyond your mind and body or not, here every day people are testing you out. <laughs> if you do not know anything beyond your body and mind, then you will become immense suffering in this place. If you know a little bit of something beyond this body and mind, 
then you see you go through everything, it's okay. We will never let it collapse, we will never make it totally chaotic, just a right spice of confusion. <laughs> because when you're confused, you're looking, you're more alert. When you're settled, that's gone in you. You may feel more comfortable, you may feel… you may have a false sense of establishment. See, people are trying to achieve this sense of establishment by creating securities around themselves normally. Make a family, secure family, secure job, secure life situations, secure social situations, you feel good. But you constantly live with the fear that if any one of these things are taken away from you, you will become upside down. You have noticed and probably you yourself have gone through this, people who are living wonderfully today, tomorrow simply because somebody died or their property went away or something else happened, you find them absolutely broken and finished. Yes? Haven't you seen this again and again in the world? Or probably you yourself have gone through this. So this kind of establishment is not going to take you through life and beyond. The moment you say, I am intending to be spiritual, it means that you have long-term plans for your life. Your life plans are not just between birth and death, you're thinking beyond. That's what it means, isn't it? Once you start thinking beyond the body, that means you have very long-term plans for your well-being. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You are not settling for short-term plans, you have very long-term plans about yourself. So if that is so, the most important thing is to at least establish a little piece of something in you which is beyond your body and your mind. If you don't have that, this place will be a huge suffering. So if you are suffering, you must know that you need to do some sadhana to establish something within you, not to fall upon somebody, not to bite at someone who is around you not to complain about everybody around you. You must understand, you need little more sadhana, you need some inner establishment. What I want you to understand is, if all we were aiming for is spiritual evolution, all these things would not be necessary. Some simple process, slowly you would evolve. We are doing all these things where if you are not in the experience, if you look at it, seem to be violent and insensitive. We are doing all these things because we are not looking for evolution. We are seeing how to mutate you from one dimension to another, quick. If we are seeking evolution, we could have slowly done it. All these kind of drastic methods wouldn't be needed. I would become even more drastic by nature, by my understanding and left to myself, I would be maybe many, many fold more drastic. But this is how much the social situations allow. If you go one step forward, there will be too much problems. So, in a certain way, I'm terribly held back because there is an outside society which we have to face and which we have to be in tune with to make things happen here peacefully. And now all of you have become your own kind of society. So you don't need any external, you're not reading newspapers or mag magazines, so no outside gossip is coming. But you have su sufficient gossip inside the ashram, isn't it? Isn't it so? <laughs> so this has become a society of its own. So even this society, unfortunately, is not hundred percent open to everything. Even here you have to do things carefully. That's very unfortunate, but that is the realities of life. I'm not a dreamer, 
So, we're just doing work just to the extent. If we push it a little more, there are many people here who will get very upset about little, little things. So, to maintain this social order and the larger social order, it's a huge compromise. The outside society situations we can't change overnight, it's not in our hands. But if this society becomes more mature, more understanding, more centered within themselves, not bothering and meddling with what's happening with somebody else, I could become a little more drastic, <laughs> become a little more forceful, make growth a little more compulsory. Even now it's compulsory, but I could make your growth so much more compulsory that you cannot escape it. If you allow me a little more freedom as to what I can do here and what I cannot do here, don't bring all the limitations of social living that exists in the outside society into this situation. Here at least, let people be the way they want to be. We don't, you know, we don't deviate from for what purpose ashram is set for, you know, established for. If you create a situation that nobody deviates from what, for what purpose this place is established for, then making this a more, a much bigger possibility than what it is becomes a reality. But when people keep deviating from the basic purpose for which the ashram is established, using the situations for their own purposes, then the whole possibility comes down. But uh, I know when hundred human beings live in one place, all these problems exist. <coughs> I'm not averse to it. I'm not afraid of it. Nor do I want to run away from it. But if we lower that, we can make the possibilities little more compulsive, little more compulsory to grow. So now that you're in ashram, no simple nidra, yoga nidra. <laughs> you don't know what's yoga nidra? Nidra means sleep, yoga means you know. So, when you sleep, you simply sleep. Don't try to do any funny things with it. Like I was telling them in the morning, I know you have been told before you go to sleep, somebody tells you sweet dreams. <laughs> okay, nightmares. <laughs> so whether you today want to witness a romantic movie or a horror movie, it's your choice. But all these fancy things come into you only when you don't use yourself sufficiently in your day-to-day -day life. If you use yourself fully, hundred percent during the day, when your head touches the pillow, you're dead. <laughs> the next thing is only peacock in the morning. <laughs> then you simply sleep. It's very important. If you want to be spiritual, you learn to do everything simply, the way it is. If you eat, you simply eat. But uh, you have always been told, having a dinner means you have to make much conversation to make the food tasty. <coughs> it speaks badly of the cook, but you have to do many things along with it. No, because every aspect, if you look at it, if you simply do it, it can become a tremendous possibility. For example, eating. Eating means what? 
taking a little bit of food, which is a, a piece of earth, taking a piece of earth and making it into yourself, not a small process, a tremendous process, isn't it? Something that is not you is becoming you. It is the very basis of your spiritual longing is just this. You want to experience everything as yourself. The very basis, the engine that fires the love in you, the engine that fires the sex in you, the engine that fires all the emotions in you, all the greed in you, all the ambition in you is just this that you want to experience something which is not you as yourself. And that is there every day when you eat your food, isn't it? Something which is not you is actually becoming you. If you pay enough attention to the simple process of eating and simply eat, simply eat, nothing else, just eating, you will see eating is an explosive process. And how can you talk to somebody else? It is such a big process. So when you sleep, just sleep. Leave your yoga alone, leave your spirituality alone. You just sleep like already, many of you are already doing. Let's go. Yeah?